uh, back at the uh, inorganic and physical chemistry department of uh, the Indian Institute of Science, our group is basically looking at a lot of surfaces and interfaces. Our interest is related to a variety of interfaces. Uh, it could be solid liquid, solid solid, or liquid like liquid. So you can have an interface between a liquid and a liquid like system. So we try to probe all this. Uh, if I have to define some of our research based on the materials, these are the kind of materials that we have been interested in for quite some time now. If you look at the first one, layer ternary chalcogenides, been working on binary chalcogenides for some time, but this is a little baby in our group the last some years or so, uh, particularly related to sulfosilinides. I'm going to talk on these two a little more in detail, that's why they're in bold. Um, recently, some years ago, we started working on uh, a recent addition to this family, phosphochalcogenide, MPX3. If I have time, I probably would touch upon that and, uh, on that as well. Transition metal nitrides and carbides, titanium nitride and titanium carbide has been in our group for, uh, for several years now, more than 10, 12 years. Titanium nitride and titanium carbide. You had the titanium carbide that was talked about by Professor Gogozzi yesterday from a different context. Uh, organic thin films, we've been into a lot of self-assembly processes and also language logic films. Exfoliated graphite and graphite oxide, I still call it graphite oxide because we started working on graphite oxide in the 90s, late 90s. And uh, for paper's sake, once in a while I call it graphene oxide, but then it's still graphite oxide to me. And molten deep protectex, these are akin to ionic liquids, so we do have interest in developing electrolytes for many of these electrochemical systems based on these eutectics as well. Uh, before I just go on to those two particular aspects which I want to talk about in detail, just give you one or two examples of what's happening in the group that will give you a glimpse of uh, the current research. Been interested in looking at lots of inorganic materials and we also have interest in organic materials as electrodes. And this is one such which was designed based on what we call as dihydroanthracene succinic anhydride polymer. So we made this polymer with certain intentions to have certain porosity, certain uh, uh, aspects of say lithium uptake points for example. And then we do that and then get on to looking at kind of uh, 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 the lithium battery performance as you see here with large number of cycles even at very high current density one can uh, charge and discharge. It's about 3 ampere per gram which is fairly high for an organic uh, material. Yeah, I'm going to talk on one another aspect for a few minutes or so. I'm quite thrilled about it because uh, we, we have always been interested in interfaces and one of uh, our group's interest is to look at interfacial reactions and what is it that I would say right now is an interfacial reaction wherein you have water air interface, we have a particular molecule stabilized at the interface. So at the interface we carry out reactions, so what do we do? The idea of having this molecule at the interface in a language trough is to make sure that you have a nicely organized structure. I have a barrier which actually compresses these molecules at the interface, so I have nicely organized structure and subsequently I have an electrode just touching the, the water and carry out electrochemistry. So you have electrochemistry under surface pressure. Two stimuli here, one is electric field and the other one is surface pressure. It does give certain advantages. I'll give you one example of that before I just go on to, to other ones. Uh, we've been interested in looking at certain polymers. I'll just tell about this particular polymer which everybody knows and it's, it, it, it received a Nobel Prize some years ago, polyaniline. One reason why polyaniline has not seen the light of the day commercially is its processability. And the processability is related to the polaronic and the bipolaronic forms and things like that. So people have been looking at whether they can have 100% polaronic form, for example. When we started with, that was not our intention, but then we ended up that way. There are lots of other things that we are interested in at the, at the, at the interface. So what we have done in this particular case is to stabilize aniline at the interface and then subsequently polymerize it at the interface. So this polymerization happens in C2 under surface pressure and with electric field. And the reason why we go about doing it, I just mentioned to you about the polaronic and the bipolaronic form. Whenever you make a polymer, a polyaniline, using chemical or electrochemical or photochemical and whatnot, you always end up with a mixture of these two. Essentially, if you look at the structure, one of them has uh, 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 the, the, the benzenoid and the quininoid ring, the other one will have only the benzenoid ring. That's what actually differentiates these two. So essentially, one is to have one of the forms, which is the benzenoid ring. So what we have done is to look at the surface polymerization. When we do the surface polymerization in C2 and XC2, under surface pressure and no surface pressure, using Raman spectroscopy, we try to understand what kind of conformation it has. And it immediately tells us that you do have a polaronic form predominantly 
about 95% of a polaronic form when we polymerize it in the surface pressure, and that's also shown up in the altimetric signatures. The altimetric signatures can be easily explained based on all this, which is quite well known. Leucoemeraldin, demeroplin, emeraldin, tepernigranulin, and the quinone hydroquinone type of system, which is present in the XE2 to polymer sa polymerized sample, while under pressure you don't see one of the redox peaks. But then what is the consequence of that? The consequence of that is what I'm going to show you right now in the form of a video. Uh, this is uh, an electrode on which I have polymerized on one side under surface pressure. So this has a polyaniline on a flexible graphite electrode. So I have polymerized it separately and then I'm using it in an electrochemical cell. I have the two other electrodes. When I try to do IV measurement, you see the nice actuator action here. You nicely, the, the electrode moves up and then when I change the potential, it just comes down. And this is because it has a particular form which is the polaronic form. While when I have the other form of the, the, the bipolaronic or the polaronic and the bipolaronic mixture, you would not see this actuator action. And this is simply because of what has happened at the interface because of the two stimuli that I, I, I was talking about. We've been trying to understand this a bit more and we know a little bit as to why it happens. Something to do with intercalation. I will not go into the details of that uh, in this particular talk. So, this surface uh, 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 electrochemistry or at the interface, interfacial electrochemistry gives a lot of, lot of scope in, in, in our opinion. One another thing that uh, I, I just wanted to kind of briefly point out is uh, I just mentioned to you about the eutectics and this is one of the eutectics that we have developed based on quote unquote green solvents, they are all amides and, and, and uh, with that we have been able to kind of deposit gallium nitride. Gallium nitride is traditionally deposited on a surface using physical methods. Not very easy to have a chemical method and particularly electrochemical simply because the deposition happens at potentials beyond the, the, the solvent decomposition or the supporting electrolyte decomposition we call it. But then using this particular solvent, it's possible for us to have the, the deposition of gallium nitride and you see a good luminescence. It's, it's not defect free, it does have a defect associated with that. But then we do see that you have a PL associated with the band gap and then you also have the, the other PL uh, <coughs> from the defects associated with the material. So we've been working on this as well for quite some time. So what I would do in the, the next uh, half an hour or so is to talk about the first two aspects in detail. Time permits, I'll just talk about the third one quite briefly. Been interested in uh, looking at a lot of battery systems and one of them is uh, related to the metal air battery. Metal air battery, before I just get on to that, just two slides of this because the, the material that we'll be working on will have certain things to do with what I talk about here. Very basic uh, electrochemistry. Whenever I have electrochemical reactions, all these things happen. You have mass transport from the bulk, gets onto the surface and when it gets onto the surface, it has to get absorbed. Mind you, the analyte is in the liquid phase and the electrons are in the solid or on the electrode surface and they have to interact. So there has to be absorption. Subsequently, there's a Marcus term which is called the reorientation energy. And then you have electron transfer and the whole thing happens. And any of these electro electrochemical systems will have a huge electric field at the interface. Second point to be noted. And this is something that people talk about all the time. Whenever you need to have a good kinetics that should happen between the electrode and the spaces in the solution, you need to have what we call as delta G of absorption. This particular process, zero. In other words, we say that it has to be electro neutral. It shouldn't be heavily absorbed. It should not be not absorbed as well. So you need to have the delta G close to zero in order to have a, a, a good reaction that happens. I will not go into the details of it, but then only this is what we need to kind of uh, keep in mind. I'll just come back to, to this a little later. All right, so come to the metal air battery. Metal air battery has been uh, in, in the literature for quite a while, particularly related to the primary batteries. Primary batteries, metal air batteries have been used commercially as well, even now. All the hearing aid batteries are all metal air batteries, but, but then they are all primary batteries. And uh, even in high-end applications that it's been used, I'll show you one or two applications as we go along. So essentially, we have metal which dissolves and then it gets deposited back and that's the reaction. And then on the other side, you have oxygen from air uh, gets reduced uh, during discharge and then it has to be evolved during charging. So essentially, you need to have the same surface doing both reduction of oxygen as well as evolution of oxygen in some sense. 
Why is this important? If you look at the energies associated with different battery systems, you would see this metal ion battery systems have far higher energy densities available than something like lithium ion, which, which is what we are using. So, there is a lot of interest and people have been trying to understand and uh, uh, look at different materials. Not easy to have many catalysts which will do both these reactions together. And there are advantages and disadvantages of all these metal ion batteries and uh, the catalyst as well. I just told you that this kind of metal ion batteries, particularly the primary ones have been used and these are two places, one in Singapore, one in uh, Santa Barbara where uh, the buses are run using zinc air batteries and this is all mechanically recharged. What does it mean? Zinc dissolves and then you just have the zinc hydroxide that comes off and subsequently when the whole electrode dissolves you just replace it with another zinc plate. So this is what you know mechanically recharged uh, electro, I mean battery and that is what is used. So, it can be used at high end applications is what I just wanted to tell you. So, essentially what we have is oxidation of zinc and then you have this particular reaction oxygen going to, to, to uh, by a 2 electron or a 4 electron process and quite recently people have, and people have always been after oxygen reduction catalyst which goes all the way to water if it has to be in an aqueous medium or the hydroxyl groups if it is in, in certain pH conditions. But then we have recently found that particularly for the zinc air battery one does not have to have a 4 electron uh, uh, catalyst, oxygen reduction catalyst. It is enough if you have this 2 electron reduction catalyst that also works for zinc air battery. That, that just a piece of information but then go on to the lithium air battery, slightly different, you cannot work in aqueous medium, you are working in a non aqueous medium. Typically lithium goes in, in, into the solution as lithium plus and then the oxygen reduction leads to peroxide is what the reaction that one wants and not the oxide. So, the catch here is to find a catalyst that stops here and does not take it all the way to oxide because this is quite stable and it is not very easy to reverse it. If it is going to be at this particular point, it is possible for us to reverse it so that you can have rechargeability. So, the catalyst is to take the, the, the uh, discharge product to peroxide because the peroxide comes through superoxide. So, you have a superoxide in the peroxide formation and it should not go to the oxide uh, uh, during the discharge process. If it goes to the oxide process, then the rechargeability is going to be very, very low. Now, just go on to a little bit on the aqueous solution. These are the kind of catalysts that are known for oxygen reduction, oxygen evolution and hydrogen evolution. So, essentially one needs to actually look for a catalyst which will have a good oxygen reduction capability and also a good oxygen evolution capability. That is when we started working on, it is probably about 2005 or so when we started working on this nitrides and carbides, but then I am going to talk about this particular thing which is a solid solution of the nitride and carbide and that has come up quite well in recent times. When we started this, this was the paper that was available on the use of these uh, nitrides and carbides in catalysis. Quite some time ago, it was used in chemical catalysis and was left as such. But then something like titanium nitride, quite easily available. Uh, physically, it is possible to kind of coat it on any surface as I will show you uh, as I go along. You can also make nanostructures based on this, has certain advantages. Some of these advantages are given here. It has the density of states near the Fermi level very close to that of a platinum group. Platinum is a great catalyst. So, there is no reason to say that this will not be a good catalyst. Or there is every reason to say that it will be a good catalyst. And more than all that, I would just talk about Oops. More than all that, I would just talk about this particular thing where the bonding in titanium nitride can be looked at as metallic, covalent or ionic. It has all of them in it. So, if I try looking at the titanium titanium bond distance in titanium nitride, it is close to titanium metal. If I just look at the mixing of carbon 2 is 2p orbitals with titanium d orbitals, do the calculations, you would see that they mix quite well, there is certain covalency in it. And if you do an XPS, for example, you see the charge separation, there is an ionicity in it as well. So, you have different kinds of bonding that is available, and in titanium nitride, titanium is in 3 plus. And if you take titanium carbide, titanium is in 4 plus. And both can be easily mixed and they form nice solid solutions. What does that mean? You essentially have mixed valent states that are possible in the system. So, essentially what we do is to kind of make this kind of structures with different uh, uh, compositions of carbon and nitrogen and uh, I would be concentrating on this particular composition for certain reasons I will just talk to you a while later as to why it is so. So, we make this particular material by different procedures in the form of bulk and characterize them uh, by, by x-ray diffraction to have a single phase and whatnot. 
And subsequently, we just make this bulk material and make them in the form of nanowires. Why do I have to have nanowires in this particular case? Processability is easy. It's a ceramic material, high density, not very easy to coat on the surface unless you have, uh, have them in the form of nanostructures. It's possible to completely convert this into, into this kind of structures, nanostructures, and they're pretty long as well. And it's possible for us to, to look at a sin, single individual nanowires and then look at the transfer property. So what you are seeing here is a single uh, nanowire of ethanol carbonitrite and these are the four contacts that are given. It is possible to look at the transport properties associated with them. It is very important because if I want to use it in electrochemistry, I need certain conductivity. I can't afford to have a regime where uh, it becomes a semiconductor and I can't really uh, have good catalytic activity. Now another advantage as far as electrochemistry is concerned is the tunability and work function. If I look at the titanium nitride, the work function is 3.8 and titanium carbide is 5.2 and it is possible to kind of vary it linearly say from 3.2 all the way to 5.2. So you will see the linearity in the work function is a function of composition and we work at this particular point. Why do we work at that particular point? As I said, I will just come to that in a while. So we just do a Kelvin probe microscopy to understand the work function it turn out to be pretty good in terms of uh, the linearity that we are talking about. And all these uh, uh, structures are to be characterized, the usual way of characterizing them, the, the X-ray photo electron spectroscopy particularly, it's important uh, uh, simply because we have to make sure that uh, we don't have titanium dioxide on the surface. If there's titanium dioxide, it's going to be a semiconductor, then all my activity is not going to be okay. Now, I just have made this system, the, the, the material, and then start to look at the oxygen reduction process. And oxygen reduction in this particular case. I am going to use it in aqueous batteries, I will do it in an aqueous medium. So, this is the oxygen reduction peak, which is, uh, you know, which is just possible with almost any material, it is only the potential that one looks at, whether it is close enough to, to, the, to the reversible potential or what is the, the O potential associated with this particular process on that electrode is what one bothers about. So, all the uh, usual characterization in terms of how many electrons are involved and what is the kind of kinetic current density associated. I just would like to point out particularly to the student audience here, yeah, whenever we talk of any of these kind of reactions, it is good to look at the rate constant associated with these processes. And in an electrochemical reaction, the rate constant is a function of potential. So at every potential, you will have a different rate constant. So it is one thing to talk about something like turnover frequency, but then in electrochemical terms, it is essential to talk about the rate constant. So one looks at the rate constant associated with that using what we call as rotating disk electrode or rotating ring disk electrode measurements and that actually gives us how much of oxygen is converted to peroxide, how much of oxygen is converted to water. That indirectly gives us the number of electrons associated with that. You never end up with a whole number in an electrochemical setup. You always have a composite number, pretty close to 4, 3.8, 3.9 or 4.1. So we know that it is a good oxygen reduction catalyst. I just mentioned to you that I get back to this particular composition. One of my collaborators actually works quite a bit on, on the calculations on these materials. If you look at uh, what is given here, for this particular composition, if I look at the Fermi level and the D z square orbital of the, the metal, metal component, the titanium, it exactly lies close to the Fermi level. What does that mean? It can interact with the pi star orbital of oxygen, which is a requirement for oxygen reduction. And then I have another graph given here wherein the overlap of the d orbital of the metal and the p orbital of the non metal in this particular case nitrogen if you have a good overlap you have a high covalency and you have increased rate why is this important i just mentioned to you the two slides saying that adsorption reorientation and whatnot these are all associated with adsorption of the analyte on the surface and if you look at uh, something like oxygen reduction which is a multi electron transfer process you can't really pinpoint one particular aspect or one particular uh, 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 in a parameter which gives you the catalytic activity. So one needs to look at all this and this is the reason why we have actually chosen this particular composition and we have been working with that particular composition. Okay, we have this material and I have the oxygen reduction and I will just show you briefly the oxygen evolution part of it. Then uh, this is the, the, the rechargeable battery that I am just going to, to uh, assemble based on this. Anything to do with zinc, one of the issues is the, the dendrite formation. Zinc dissolves, and if you want to deposit zinc on zinc surface from a solution, it actually forms little needle shaped crystals and then it just grows, 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 and after that, the two electrodes short. That's a major issue with respect to 
this kind of values. It's not necessarily with zinc alone, it's also possible with certain other chemistries as well, but with zinc it manifests quite a bit. So, what we did was to kind of look at a gel which gives us advantage in terms of reducing the kinetics of the dendrite formation and that's how we ended up having a gel for this particular value. This is a normal gel which is already reported by somebody. This is a polyacrylic acid potassium salt of the polyacrylic acid. What we did was to tune the composition a bit, adding a zinc salt or whatever, and use that in, as an electrolyte. So when we use that as an electrolyte, just look at the charge and discharge curve that we have. Uh, this is what we call a shallow charge and shallow discharge. So we just charge for about half an hour and discharge for about half an hour at certain current densities. Try to look at it, and then you have a fairly large number of cycles that are formed. And the, oh, this is the oxygen evolution part of it, which I did not talk much in detail. You do have a good oxygen evolution kinetics as well. But even with all that, if you look at the, the, the uh, microscopy pictures, you have dendrite formation. Dendrite formation is not got rid of, but then it is reduced to a large extent. So that's what this one is all about. These are all the same pictures related to that. And the dendrite formation kinetics considerably reduced in the gel electrolyte is what we feel when it comes to the titanium carbon nitride as the catalyst. But the same catalyst we have used in lithium oxygen battery. I just mentioned to you that lithium oxygen you need to have in a non aqueous medium, and you also have to have uh, 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 the, the superoxide and then the, the peroxide formation. And this is related to the superoxide, this is the peroxide formation, and then you have the reverse uh, reactions taking place. Lithium oxygen chemistry is tougher than zinc oxygen chemistry. And typically, the, the cycles will not go beyond about 10, 20, 25, whatever. So with this we've been able to kind of get to, this is one of the old slides, we've been able to kind of get to a little longer, about 125, 150 cycles at fairly high current density in, in lithium oxygen uh, chemistry with respect to, to the titanium carbon nitride as the uh, oxygen electrode. Of course one needs to understand that I do not have any other product that's formed, so we do both in situ and also in situ diffraction measurements and make sure that what we have as the discharge products is the peroxide and not the oxide or the carbonate that comes from the solvent or whatever. Some additional information on this particular thing. I will not go into the details of this. I'll just go on to the second aspect of it. Um, I, I hope I have uh, some time. Great. So I think I'll just get on to the second aspect of it, which I just want to talk about, uh, particularly related to one of the layered materials, the molybdenum sulfur cell. We've been working on many of these layered materials, sulfosalinides, cellurites, with different uh, cation and also the anion. We have ternary, quaternary systems, and they all have advantages. If you take something like molybdenum sulfide, it's nicely flat and it's a nice layered structure. You can peel it off, and then people have been using it for quite some time for both devices and also in chemical uh, applications. But then the moment you have a solid solution, the moment you have some selenium in place itself, partly, it is not like this anymore, there's a strain associated with the lattice. Because of the strain in the lattice, you start to have properties which are very different. There are optical properties, there are electrical properties that turn out to be different when you have strain in the lattice. People have been working on it as to how to induce strain in the system, and we believe, based on certain preliminary uh, uh, experiments, data, that is inherent strain associated with this kind of uh, solid solution, which is molybdenum sulfur selenide in this particular case I talked about. So I'll just stick to that particular material for the rest of my talk and then um, uh, <clears throat> give you one particular uh, information on supercapacitors at high rate, okay, which is basically trying to look for AC filtering applications. So I'm just going to talk about the sulfur selenide. The possibility of an inherent strain in the lattice due to the presence of sulfur and selenium together is what I talk about. And if you look at the MOS2 and SE2, there have been calculations we have done and then others have done as well. Whenever you have this kind of uh, uh, solid solution, you start to see the bond length being different. What does that mean? The MOMO bond distance in MOS2 and MOSSC, they are different and they come closer. What does that mean? You have better conductivity. So you have more conducting material when it comes to a solid solution. And the same thing happens when I just have molybdenum tungsten sulfide or molybdenum tungsten selenide, for example. There are many of these things that are available in the, in the, in the literature. People have been working on it only in the last few years as far as this one is concerned. So there is a strain in the lattice, the microscopic level. It's very important to, to, to know. So we just go about making all these things with different compositions using solid state method. And pretty clean, you have all elements in an evacuated quartz tube at high temperature. We have fairly good large crystals that get formed. Very nice uh, 
uh, layer material and these crystals are the order of you know uh, millimeter to sometimes centimeter as well so we, we have this kind of crystals that are getting formed once we have these crystals we go about characterizing them uh, the first part of this something that we still trying to understand and that is what actually leads to some uh, information of the strain in the lattice we do have Raman modes of MOS2 and MOSE2 basically the phonon modes and the moment I have a solid solution you have what we call as quote unquote the two mode behavior which has been reported in the literature for similar systems. We've been trying to understand the strain associated with this and uh, 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 as I'm talking right now high resolution microscopy is being done uh, to see where the sulfur and selenium are where the molybdenum and tungsten are so that we can understand the strain a bit better. And uh, it's possible for us to kind of peel off and then have a single layer or use a solvent and exfoliate and then have two layers a single layer like what we do for normal molybdenum sulfide type systems and we just go about characterizing them the way uh, we, we do all, all other layer materials. Essentially what I'm going to do is to kind of use this in ultra high rate supercapacitors particularly when I convert the MOSSC from 2H to 1 phase. I'll convert that into 1 phase, 1T phase. 1T phase conversion is by the usual process of lithium intercalation and uh, exfoliation. So you do have that particular thing leading to 1T phase of this. The advantage of the 1T phase of MOSSC is that the stability of this 1T phase is much, much higher than the stability of the 1T phase of MOS2 or MOSC. Why does one need MO 1T phase? 1T phase is more conducting and the molecular coordination is different as well. So we make the 1T phase of MOSSE and then use that as, as a capacitor control. Why do we need that? And that's what's given here. The AC line filtering devices, you need to have high capacitance at certain frequency. And there are reasons as to why we, we look for all this high rate capacitance. We just make the 1T phase of MOSSE uh, by the usual way, lithium intercalation and things like that. And then essentially what happens is the molecular coordination changes from the terminal to smart oxyhedral and and one can look at the microscopy and then see whether it is in the honeycomb or the zigzag structure which also gives you information on whether it is the 1T or the phase. There's plenty of information available in the literature. This is actually from one of the papers. Uh, I guess the other one, I'm sorry, the reference is not it's cut off. So you, we know, uh, we understand as to how the 1T phase gets formed and it's been suggested that when we form the 1T phase, that is a water molecule, I mean the water molecules actually goes into it stabilizing the molybdenum in the octahedral coordination. And this is something that's known. And if you take something like 1T phase of MOS2 and leave it outside, after a couple of days it gets converted to the 2H phase. And MOS2 again, MOS2 is even faster, MOS2 you can keep it a little longer. But then this particular material we find that it's quite stable, even for an year or so, you can just make this 1T phase and then keep it stable. This is additional information on, on the XPS of, of the 1T phase of the MOSSE. And this is uh, after about six months, you see the X ray diffraction more or less the same, and you start to see a little things coming up. And that it is 1T phase is what's uh, given here. The conductivity of it is much higher than the 2H phase. And this again, after about six months, it stays the same. So we have the 1T phase of this particular material also thermally stable, and the thermal stability is fairly high. MOS2, it, it, it heated to about 45, it gets converted to 2H and this can be kept even at, at about 100, 140 degrees centigrade, it still stays as anti phase and for a fairly long time at room temperature. We use this a highly conducting material for the capacitor purpose, I just would like to show you one, one particular thing, this is about 1000 volts per second. So, we have a fairly decent capacitor behavior, I mean it's not perfect rectangle but then it's not that bad either. For, for a very high rate uh, capacitor. So we try to understand the, uh, what happens in different compositions. We do have the, 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 the uh, time constant associated, oops, sorry. Uh, time constant associated with the, the uh, capacitor. And then just go on to looking at the usual numbers in terms of what is the energy density and what is the power density associated with it turns out to be a fairly uh, uh, good capacitor material. The remaining few minutes, I'll just give you just a few slides on this because quite thrilled about it, there's a new family of materials that we have been working on uh, based on transitional thiophosphates. And M is the first row transition element, P, and then S can be SC or D. That's basically chalcogen. So you have an MPX3 type of material. This material was known in 70s 
but, but, but uh, what was done was uh, to look at the crystal structure and then that's it. And after the advent of all these layered materials, people have started looking for new layered materials and this is coming to me. I'm going to talk about this FEP S3, one of them. This is a monoclinic structure, C2 barren, and uh, it's possible to make them the way I just told you earlier. So just have them from the elements, you have nice single crystal, when I say single crystal, it's highly oriented crystal that can be formed and uh, you have a fairly good diffraction and subsequently just see what kind of a semiconducting property it has. These are all semiconductors and the band gap can be tuned depending on the chalcogen, depending on the, on the cation that we have. I told you that it's the first row transition element except zinc which is a D10 system. You have all other things giving you certain properties <coughs> that are very, very good. Even magnetic properties are <coughs> being studied as far as this is concerned. So you have the semiconducting property that can be used in possibly devices go along. So you have a pretty good uh, uh, layer structure as you see, fairly large size crystals, <coughs> Sorry. several micron size and one can again peel them off and then exfoliate them into a single layer or a few layer device. And uh, this, this is a single layer raw material and whenever we, we try to look at the single layer XRD as such, it gets restacked and you start to see the, the, the other plane as well. So we have essentially about two layer, three layer, four layer, which can be easily formed by the solvent exfoliation. And the, the atomic force microscopy gives the, <coughs> this is probably the last slide that I have. Um, we use this for oxygen reduction, oxygen evolution, and hydrogen reduction. All these three things require a different uh, 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 parameter as well as the material sense. For hydrogen evolution, for example, People say that the adsorption of H is pretty good on S and the P side. So if you have a P and S side in the material, it's going to be a good catalyst for hydrogen evolution. We do have this PS3 unit. If you look at this particular material, in the unit cell you have two formula units. So essentially you have a P2S6 type of a cluster which has the ion all over. So you have nice layer structure with this kind of a PS3 clusters that are available for taking up hydrogen. And it turns out to be good for oxygen reduction as well. I just mentioned to you earlier as to what are the things that are required for oxygen reduction. In addition to that, you also have a fairly uh, decent oxygen evolution uh, uh, reaction. I just have to point out one thing. Any material that you have, chalcogenide or whatever it is for oxygen evolution, it doesn't happen on the bare surface. Before the oxygen gets evolved, the material gets oxidized to some extent. So essentially, the surface will be covered with an oxide and an oxyhydroxide and that's what actually behaves as a catalyst, but that oxyhydroxide on the underlying FEPS3 is, is uh, required for the stability of this particular material. So you see that it's a good uh, tri-functional uh, catalyst as well. We've been using this for many other things and we have MNPS3, NIPS3 and many different uh, metal uh, phosphochalcogenide which are being looked at, both for uh, capacitors and also for uh, battery purposes. Since they are all layered materials, it's possible for us to decal it and uh, it also happens in certain cases that the material degrades and then you start to have lithium sulfur or lithium, lithium selenium type of package. So essentially what I said in the last, what I discussed in the last uh, 45 minutes or so is to, to talk about this TICN carbon nitride which works as a bifunctional electrode. Showed you that it's possible to have uh, zinc air and also the lithium air batteries that can be formed using this as an oxygen electrode. And MOSSE, I'm quite thrilled about it, and we have been doing lots of other things with this uh, particular material. And uh, the, the strain is something that we've been trying to quantify right now. It does stabilize the 1T phase to a very, very large extent. And uh, the MPX3, which is a new new family of the layered materials, very good properties as well, particularly related to electrochemical energy storage. And uh, I do acknowledge all these students, and one of them uh, must be here in the audience. And uh, Nanomission DST has always been uh, quite generous in funding all the program. I thank Nanomission DST as well. I thank you all for attention. I'll be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you.
these are all uh, you know stacked with Van der Waals interaction. So the conductivity is in plane, not in the z line. So if one doesn't really have you you will have everything happening on the basal plane and not between these two. Okay, in any of these two D materials. So as long as you have a good conductivity here, in plane conductivity, it is expected to be good. Otherwise, uh, if it is stable in terms of chemical stability. Yes, definitely. I mean, like, you know, I, I did not really go into the details of that. See, if I just have a bulk uh, layer material, for example, this particular thing, FEPS3, the conductivity is different as opposed to a few layer as opposed to a single layer material. And the electronic structure is different as well, the band gap is different as well. So, I just mentioned to you very briefly that you can have five or six layer material. And that's what is essential for this particular purpose when I talked about the, the, uh, the capacitor. I, I can't really have a very high bulky material where the capacitance comes down and I can't afford to have a pure single layer material in. So that is the catch here and then one would be able to kind of optimize how many number of layers. There's a range and that would be a lot of people would be able to use it. And the preparation conditions allow us to have this kind of a range possible. One more question. Which one? Uh, one T phase of one. Or, uh, MOS so this could be uh, if you change something or make some compound like right, uh, some uh, atom or something like that, we can use like a conductor or something like that. Uh, we haven't really looked at that. But then the one T phase of MOSC as I told you is far highly known. No, it is much more stable than one T phase of MOS2. That's what I kept on saying. It's stable for about a year. I can keep it under room temperature and it's still stable. And we presume that at this stage, it's a strain associated with the lattice which is responsible, which we'll have to again confirm, of course. It's stable. So, not that the stability cannot be, uh, see, th th there are studies wherein people intercalate ions and then make it stable. That's possible. But then we don't want to do it. We don't want to have any other external spaces in the system. Okay, thank you. Can we, yeah. Um, hello sir, I have a question regarding the TICN system. Yes. So you mentioned that in the particular uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, you had a 4.4 four, uh, 4 EV band gap. Uh, uh, no. Uh, yeah, uh, it's somewhere in between 3.7 and 5.2 or whatever. Yeah. So, but but not it, the band gap, that is a work function. Oh, all right. Not the band gap. Okay, it's because a work in function. engineer's case you have a continuous at the point no, 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 no. These are all highly conducting material. In okay. fact, it was mentioned yesterday in yesterday's talk as well. TIN is more conducting than TI is. So, uh, they are all highly conducting material. Okay. Now, what I just showed the, as a linear variation was the work function. And uh, one question regarding the OER. So, yes. in HER, uh, acidic HER, we have uh, H adsorption energy as the descriptor basically. For OER, what would you characterize as the basic descriptor? It's very difficult to point out a particular parameter for anything uh, like OER or water because it's multi-electron transfer and not just the electron transfer, you also have chemical stress associated with that. So you have a variety of species that get formed. You talk of something like oxygen related system, you have OH, OOH, oxide itself, oxygen itself getting absorbed on the surface. And these absorption characteristics are very different depending on the potential. Uh, in calculations, you can actually have up to certain level, you'll be able to kind of say what it is. See, in an experiment, at a particular potential, I don't have one species. I have more than one species. And the thermodynamics of absorption is governed by the concentration of the species that you have. The concentration is something that I don't have control over on screen because I do not know. So, what we have uh, theoretically, it gives input. And we can talk about certain parameters, that's what I mentioned. People started talking about work function as the main descriptor for any of these things. That was by Trasity a long time ago. And then people started talking about the E band density states. And now people talk about the S band and the P band density states as well. I just showed you about the covalency which was introduced by Gordon some time ago. So we do have several parameters that one can talk about. It's still not possible for you to point out that yes, this is what is this. So, would you say that system specific, like it varies with the kind of system you are dealing with for catalyzing OER? Yes, or I mean it, it can be system specific and that's possible to, to identify. Yes, you're right. Thank you sir. Okay, thank you. I think uh, we will take remaining portions at tea time.
with this, let us thank for the Sampadmas again. I request Professor Su to kindly present a token of our gratitude to Professor S. Sampad. A big round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. And thank you, Professor Sampad, for sharing your insightful thoughts uh, with the members of the audience.